Our next panel has the very interesting title, Building Strategic, uh, Europe Strategic Autonomy in an Age of Threats. Uh, and I think we all know what is the main threat today, but it's not, not the only one. Um, so, um, I would like to start our conversation from Mrs. Balfour. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I would like to ask you, um, how do you think that the Russian invasion in, in Ukraine actually um, altered the um, United States' perception on, on European security while the, the Biden administration was actually shifting even more its attention to the Indo-Pacific? Um, some say that Washington somehow is actually back in Europe after years of ambivalence, but is this true or is it a, an overblown assessment? Well, certainly if one of Putin's grievances was um, insufficient attention on the sort of global scene, that's something that um, he managed to achieve. Um, Russia undoubtedly had been shrinking down the list of uh, security threats from the point of view of the US in particular, and now is back at the top. Um, so certainly the US has had to get, has to get, has had to get involved, has been distracted uh, from its main goal, which is address the rise of China. That was the main goal of the Biden administration. It was also uh, one of the main goals of the Trump administration, and it reflects a bipartisan shift that started uh, back at the time of uh, Obama's administration. Um, so in that sense, yes, the US is now paying a lot more attention um, and is distracting um, from Biden's plan to look at China. However, I think it's very important to look at how the US is dealing with this threat. Um, it has worked, and in fact, it's been really quite remarkable the way the US administration has been working with the EU over the past weeks and months, uh, preparing the grounds for the response um, has been, uh, and I think the goal has really been about empowering Europeans. Um, they've been working side by side on all fronts, um, on the sanctions package, the head of cabinet of uh, the president of the European Commission, von der Leyen, the head of cabinet's name is uh, Bjorn Seibert, has been working uh, hand in hand with the deputy uh, director of the National Security Council. Um, the, well, even Draghi has been working with Yellen in the US for the um, uh, bank freeze. So there really has been a step by step um, cooperation in dealing with this. And this was preceded by what I think was quite a stroke of genius on part of the US administration, um, and that of declassifying intelligence to persuade European allies that actually the threat was real. And up until the 23rd of February, there was still incredulity across Europe in European capitals about Russia's intentions. And on the 24th, this shifted. And so in European capitals, you heard oh, it, they were right, the Americans were right, they had the right intelligence, which evidently um, Europeans did not have or perhaps didn't have the sufficient depth or sufficient analysis of what was happening. Um, so that too has led to a real um, solidification of the transatlantic um, relationship, which I think we can expect to last for the next couple of years. Um, I think to add to this, um, we've also seen, so the first tier, the first level of response is clearly sanctions, is clearly security and defence, and the humanitarian efforts um, in, in Europe in particular and supporting uh, refugees. There are, of course, second tier issues that also need to be looked at that uh, pertain more to um, the long term. But I think with respect to the transatlantic relationship, the idea is that the US expects Europe to take care of its neighbourhood, to take care of um, Russia in coordination with the Americans, but you know, the idea really is um, to empower Europeans to take a, a greater role. And things have been moving on the European front, despite um, previous uh, disunity, which ran very deep um, between, between European capitals on views of Russia, uh, for historic reasons, for commercial reasons, for energy reasons, all sorts of reasons. But now we've seen a real um, convergence. Um, we don't know how long that will last, and maybe we can talk a bit about this in the, in the discussion. Um, it will last, I think a lot will depend on the situation on the ground. That will shape um, a longer term uh, strategy uh, from the European um, perspective. So, so, but that, that shift is certainly um, there, and I think it will enable uh, the US 
perhaps to refocus its attention on Asia, which is what it set out to do originally. I think from the European side, there are several issues to look at. The first is obviously what it's doing on security and defence, um, commitments to increase defence spending, uh, the strategic compass which was um, agreed upon on the 21st of March. Uh, there isn't anything particularly new, but it's just a sign of a different commitment and the sign of greater strategic alliance in terms of understanding Russia's threat. Um, and then I think what's perhaps more interesting is um, the economic sta statecraft that the EU is, is di um, displaying um, at a time of war. And that is where the EU can build upon some perhaps timid steps that have been taken over the past few years. In fact, they have been taken during the Trump administration to protect the European economy from US secondary sanctions, for instance. Um, but these steps, and of course in light of, of, of China, um, so these steps have, you know, the, the EU has been consolidating some of its uh, economic statecraft tools, and I think this will also shape Euro the Europe uh, to come. Um, and then finally, I think we shouldn't forget, we have a massive threat here. We have a, um, a threat not just to Ukraine, but to, European to the European security architecture. It requires, one of the major efforts that it requires is weaning uh, Europe off um, Russian fossil fuels, but it, we shouldn't forget the fossil fuels bit. If this helps the uh, digital and green transformation that the EU had, has been um, pioneering and accelerating since COVID, good. But if it actually means that we're going to fall into other uh, patterns of dependency on fossil fuels from other authoritarian states, then we're not finding a way out. And that, again, is another open question. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Bill, I would like to, to tap into your experience on how the, European, uh, how the EU works um, and ask you um, what exactly is strategic autonomy? Because we've had various uh, definitions about it. Uh, is it, as some say, only security and defence? It's something much deeper. I believe it's something much deeper, but it's not my opinion that counts here. Um, and where exactly it should be based? Well, I've been, in my life, I've, I've interested in history, so I've read a lot of history about the sort of the uh, theological disputes in the early Christian churches about the nature of Jesus and God and whatever. And a lot of the debate about strategic autonomy reminds me of that particular thing. It's a lot of liturgy coming out of different capitals. Most of it is incomprehensible to normal mortals. Um, and I've been trying to sort of get where's the beef. Because I think the beef is in the capabilities that we have. If you're just autonomous without capabilities, you are nothing. If you have capabilities, you can operate some of them autonomously, some of them together with Americans or whoever, but to just discuss autonomy seems to be fairly fruitless. And, and let me add that I think it's time that we do a reality check after February 24th where we are. What did we get right and what did we get wrong and um, what should we do if we look ahead? As said, I mean, the EU has done quite a lot of things right after February 24th. I mean, sort of decisions on refugees, economic statecraft sanctions, um, EDF for financing weapons was quite extraordinary, mm -hmm. if you look at it. But the essence is sort of uh, the balance is not entirely good. We failed after 2014 to give attention to sorting out Donbass and Russia. We failed to understand Russia. We failed to listen to the American warnings. Most I remember seeing European foreign ministers coming out of the meetings of the Foreign Affairs Councils in Brussels for months saying the Americans are exaggerating and uh, we don't believe that the Russians are going to do something. We got Russia wrong and we failed to sort out Ukraine since 2014. That's a fairly big issue. I agree with that it's good that you can, I can produce a strategic compass um, paper, but it was not heading in the right direction, that particular compass, obviously, and we need to, to learn from that. Uh, what the Americans have de demonstrated are two things, capabilities. Um, I was struck by the picture from the airfield in Reshov in eastern Poland, which is now the hub of most things that are happening, uh, apart from the contributions that the, the Poles, needless to say, are making, which are impressive. 
It's safeguarded by the American 82nd Airborne Division and by two batteries of US Patriot missiles. It is not EU, it's Americans that have the cap not only the capabilities, but the will to do it very fast is not us. Uh, and there's a lesson in that particular thing. If we mo move ahead, what should we do? Well, we clearly need to have better capabilities in different aspects. Uh, most countries are now, those that aren't already there, are moving to 2%. Denmark, Sweden, to take two countries that are in my own, not only vicinity, but also where I happen to live. Uh, Germany is making a significant, there's going to be a lot of money that is uh, going to be spent into defence by Germany, and that's going to have effects. But these are things that produce something 10 years from now, uh, when it comes. It takes a long time to build military capabilities. We evidently need to update our picture of Russia. And we need to update our picture of Russia long term. There's a tendency to say, you have it partly in the US debate as well, we need to give an off-ramp to Putin. Well, there has to be an off-ramp for Putin in the sense that he needs to leave, I would say. As long as Putin is there, we're going to have to deal with, it's going to be a weaker Russia, no question about that. But it's going to be a more desperate and a more dangerous regime. And we have seen also in the respective European countries what they do to individuals that they don't like and things like that. An even more desperate Russian regime will be an even more dangerous part of the European continent that we share with this particular Russia. And we need to start to adjust policies accordingly. And I think that process, although I agree, there's been a remarkable coming together now. But have we updated our long-term analysis? Have we got our strategic compass right on the long-term challenge? We didn't get it right after 2014. We must get it right now. And among the tasks that we have, apart from building our own capabilities and developing what the Americans have, and we are bad at, the will to act when things are happening, and normally you need to act fairly fast, we need also to see that this is, of course, our continent. And I would say the big task, or one of the big tasks ahead, would be to make certain that we get a Ukraine 2.0. Uh, not doing only what we did in the Balkans, rebuilding the houses, we can do that. Uh, but you need to sort of rebuild, help them rebuild a country that is even stronger, even more resilient, and even better defended. If that succeeds, it is a major contribution to the security of all of the European countries. If it fails, we can be fairly desperate that it's going to be another six or eight year pause before we head for the next war. Because as long as we have elements of this particular regime in power, and it's not only Mr. Putin, by the way. I mean, I was also saying Putin's war instead of Russia's war for a while. But you have to understand it's not only Putin's war. It's a fairly wider thing. As long as that is there, that tendency to go back over the Ukraine issue will be there. And that tendency to go back against those that they see as supporting Ukraine will be there. So the strategic compass was good, uh, but I fear we need to write a new one. Mm -hmm. How do you think that we can uh, boost our capabilities faster? I mean, I, I, I understand that Mr. Bill talks about civilian capabilities, but also military capabilities. So we have the European Defence Fund, uh, we have all these PESCO programs. H how can we move faster? Well, the European Defence Fund is fine, but, but it's, uh, European Defence Fund is not defence policy. It's, that's defence industrial policy. Uh, I'm not saying that's wrong, but I mean you don't, you don't defend with the fund. You defend with forces. Um, so we, uh, we need to do that. I, I think what we need to do is uh, looking at what NATO can do better together with the Europeans. I mean, I think it's highly likely that both Finland and Sweden will apply for membership of NATO within a couple of months. And that will sort of, and the Danes will have a referendum to take away their reservations on uh, taking part in EU security and defence policies. So you will have a significant strengthening of all of the northern European dimension of NATO EU cooperation. Um, 
We have to understand, and I think that's been demonstrated vividly, uh, that we are dependent upon the relationship with the Americans. We need to do more in order to have a burden sharing that is more fair from the European and from the American point of view. Also understanding that the US has global commitments that we don't, uh, notably sort of China. Uh, but we need to do more, but to think that we can sort of replace them and do everything on our own and develop that political will to act fast within the next decade, I think, is pure illusions. Then we need to do a, be able to do more other things. Um, but that, my point has always been that they had sometimes less capabilities than will. I, I remember we, we set up, I can't remember when we set up the European Battle Group. Do you remember that? 2003. 2003. In, in another age? No. Yeah, something like that. Five, six. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It was two, dec two decades yeah. ago. We have not yet used them. And I was foreign minister for eight years, and I remember a couple of uh, discussions in the Foreign Affairs Council when it had been, there were reasons to use them, in my opinion, but there were never the political will to do it. So we had the capabilities, not necessarily that impressive, and they were not there to defeat China or Russia, but they were there to do humanitarian and political and other operations that are of relevance, but we failed to develop the political will to do it. Um, but I think on yes, this thing, I sure. think, you know, we shouldn't forget that at the end of June there's going to be a NATO summit yep. and there's going to be a new strategic concept for NATO. Mm. And my sense is that if there's anything interesting that can happen in the field of security and defence in Europe, it's actually improving the degree of cooperation between NATO and the EU with, you know, different tasks to each organisation that reflects better mm. the identity of the organisations. I wouldn't be surprised, but I don't know, I wouldn't be surprised if NATO went a little bit more towards its original purpose, uh, territorial defence, mm -hmm. and that maybe the EU focused a little bit more on the hybrid issues such as cyber, yep. um, political issues, crisis management, those areas where it already has some expertise. So I think rather than expecting all of a sudden the European army to come out of the ashes of Ukraine, I think we really need to think about how synergies can be uh, can, can be um, brought together and invested upon, um, and the level of cooperation. It's, it's hard because you have, you know, um, 30 members of uh, NATO, maybe 32 soon, uh, 27 members of the EU, lots of many different... And of course, they, they don't all overlap. Um, so it's hard work from an institutional perspective, and it requires a lot of commitment on part of officials. But I think that's the way to go. Um, because, you know, even though we seem to be fighting, well, Ukraine seems to be fighting a, a 19th century battle, but the rest of the world is actually trying to equip itself for the 21st century. Um, and really, we should focus on that. Um, so that, that would be my two cents on... on yeah. um, and I, yeah, and I very much agree with that. The only thing I would like to add, and that is to, to, to take up the things that are complicated, we need to sort out our relationship with the UK, or they need to sort out their yeah. relationship with us. Because, as has been demonstrated in this particular case as well, they are, uh, they are a European actor of significance mm -hmm. uh, that we can't neglect and that we must be able to work together with mm -hmm. better. Uh, the, the easier said than done. You, you are so good panelists that you are making the moderator irrelevant. So you are, you are actually <laughs> uh, answering uh, questions that I... But I, uh, with the danger of being, of being provocative, um, uh, you, uh, you both said that uh, Sweden and Finland could possibly apply uh, for NATO membership. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> um, there, there was a letter, I think, uh, three weeks ago, that was actually hinting more towards 42.7, uh, you know, the article of the EU treaties. Uh, do you think that this is now totally out? And they are both focusing on uh, on, on NATO. And also, um, do you think that this could make the possibility to find some kind of relationship with Russia even more difficult? Ms. Powerful first. Um, so on Article 42, I think. I mean, I think my impression is that that's not that relevant, and everybody's looking for NATO security guarantees rather than EU security guarantees. That's my impression. But I mean, this is you know. These are rumours coming from behind the scenes. We don't know exactly whether they're going to evolve. Um, how does this look uh, with respect to Russia? So this, we, here we need to go back a bit um, about the um, threat assessment of Russia and how Europeans have been divided and what the different debates 
uh, were. And um, Carl rightly pointed out, looked at you know, 2014, and maybe even take a step back, 2018, uh, sorry, 20, 2008, um, mm. Bucharest summit. Mm. And I'm just thinking, and, you, know, you asked me about um, American leadership in Europe and the transatlantic relationship, and you know, thinking back at 2008, the US was in the driving seat. 2014, the US stepped out of the driving seat and let Merkel and, um, and uh, France and Germany uh, lead on, on Crimea and negotiating um, with Russia. And, you know, I think between the two, we had a sort of contrast of the more hawkish view of Russia and the more benign view of Russia. And neither worked, right? Um, and now, uh, with hindsight, clearly, uh, what happened in 2014, the, the, uh, you know, it was just preparation for, for what is happening now. I mean, you can, we can, I think, interpret 2008 Georgia, 2014 Crimea, and the, the full invasion now as a, as a clear escalation from the, point, from the Russian point of view. But it also raises other questions. Had things been done differently, would, it, would things have been different? And I, 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 I unfortunately, have, come, have to come to the conclusion that probably not, um, in the sense that um, in 2008, several European countries were against offering Ukraine uh, a, a membership, uh, a NATO membership perspective, because they thought this would, um, it was too sensitive for Russia. Um, Ukraine did not have a membership perspective. So the fact that Putin raised this as one of, as one of the conditions was, was a bit of a, a um, it was a cons constructed, it wasn't a real, um, a real threat. And, and I think that's basically what we've had. We've had a whole series of um, attempts to construct a narrative of Ukraine threatening Russia. Um, some of it is for domestic consumption, some of it is put out there um, in, the, in the dialogue with, with the West that haven't really um, reflected what the real grievances might be. And I think we're going to see more of this in the conversations, in the negotiations or the talks that are taking place occasionally between uh, Russia and Ukraine at the moment. And I think there's a real risk, in fact, and that's, that goes also to the point of the endurance and the length of this conflict. I think there's a real risk that um, the sort of, you know, um, raise, the sort of smoke, game of smoke and mirrors will be played out again by the Russians and that you know, maybe out of fatigue or maybe out of, uh, um, you know, uh, unwillingness on the European front to en endure a long conflict, we might settle for an agreement, a ceasefire, which is actually not um, permanent, which is um, temporary. Now, I think the, what, what we're looking at now is that Europeans, and uh, probably the Americans as well, agree that we can only start talking about a ceasefire once Ukraine is happy with the conditions. Um, so that's, you know, the first point, the first principle is that it has to be negotiated between the two sides. Um, but if, the, if it is a settlement of the sort that we saw in 2014, then, then the, the, the risk is, the danger is not over. And that is a problem not just for Ukraine, but for the rest of Europe as well. So that, that is where we are at the moment, I think. What do you think? That is where we are at the moment. Um, we don't know what kind of Ukraine is going to be after this war. We can be somewhat more optimistic about that. We haven't a clue what kind of Russia is going to be after this. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to read everything that we can get hold of that Mr. Putin has said in the last six months. And that's fairly instructive. It's become more difficult lately because of the cyber warfare makes it more difficult to access things in Russia. But you can do it in different ways. It is shilling stuff. Um, he talks about this as a life and death issue for Russia. He talks about this as a threat that is the Ukraine threat is worse than Hitler. Uh, he, talks, he talks in purely sort of apocalyptic terms. And that, of course, indicates that uh, if he agrees to a ceasefire, it's going to be a ceasefire, but only a ceasefire. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as he is there with this particular vision, this particular conflict will go on. What does that mean for Russia? Well, all of my old Russian friends, and some of them are, I have to say, also Putin's friends, because they are coming, people that are coming out that I worked with sort of 30 years ago in St. Petersburg in the early 90s, uh, the reform circle there. Um, they are extremely pessimistic. Um, all of them are outside of Russia by now, by the way. Um, 
they think there's only very dark scenarios ahead. And we should not, not forget either that Russia is the only state that has collapsed twice within a century. Uh, collapsed in 1917, it collapsed in 1989, um, Sometimes Russia goes astray in a way that overburdens the state, it structures itself and it collapses into things that become very complicated indeed and very difficult to foresee the consequences of. And uh, I would say that, I wouldn't say that Russia is going to collapse, but had you asked me a year ago, I would say the likelihood of that happening was 5%. And now I'm in uh, well, uh, well up in double digits mm -hmm. for that part of the scenario as well. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think it's going to be a, an extraordinary task to disentangle what is Putinism mm. and the regime that he has managed to create and, and Russians in general. I mean, I think, and this is something also relevant in Europe, because we've talked about the divides about, of perceptions of Europe and how, uh, sorry, perceptions of Russia and how some countries in Europe have been um, warning hmm, about Russia as a threat and other countries seeing Russia in more benign terms. And that bridge, this has been really the, one of the most divisive issues in European foreign policy. That bridge is temporarily, um, that gap is temporarily bridged. But, um, but those differences could resurface again. And I think we're seeing them uh, at the moment between those countries that are less um, inclined to um, export uh, military equipment to uh, Ukraine and those who are uh, you know, more willing to perhaps provide offensive military equipment. So there's a gap there. And it will reemerge. Let's, hypothes let's you know, a hypothesis of a sort of post-Putin scenario whenever that will come. That gap will come back again um, between those who would want a more punitive attitude towards Russia and those who are more inclined of engagement towards engagement. And, um, and I think it's very important to be careful. I mean, let's not forget 1919, the Versailles Treaty and the punitive elements in that treaty and how it became a justification for the rise of Nazism, a true, a real grievance there. And, you know, if you go to, I live in Belgium, you go to one of the German war cemeteries, the soldiers are buried with black slabs because they weren't allowed to have white slabs. You know, that is so powerful, symbolically so powerful. So I think we need to be careful there. But at the same time, it, it, when I speak to the people I know in Russia, it really looks like Putin has managed to build a regime which is a fort. So it's very hard to put a spanner in the works of that fort. And it's very hard to see, um, you know, who might say, well, hang on a minute, uh, Vladimir, maybe this is going a little bit too far. We're not seeing that um, happen. We're not seeing it from the generals. We're not seeing it from the, his entourage. We're not seeing it from the population. And we're hearing these um, harrowing stories about this generational gap between younger Russians mm -hmm. who are talk, speaking to their elders about what's happening in Ukraine and the elders you know, after decades of propaganda and, you know, unfreedom during the Soviet Union, not wanting to um, address, not wanting to believe these stories. So it's really going to be very difficult to find a way to engage with Russian society um, while at the same time uh, looking at how, you know, how the, the next European order, what, what it might look like. Um. I would like to ask you both, how critical do you think that the role of Germany will be in all this? I mean, we've seen this waters at the moment with Chancellor Scholz announcing this huge uh, defense budget, new defense budget, um, uh, buying F-35s, buying, uh, I think a couple of days ago, uh, announcing that they're going to buy a drone from Israel and other countries. How critical will it be both in uh, creating a real strategic autonomy for Europe and also possibly acting as a, uh, as a bridge to, to a new Russia, maybe in the future, somehow? I mean, of course, Germany is important, I mean, purely by its size, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, now we've got, we've got the German ambassador here, so we shouldn't sort of interfere in his business too much. But, uh, of course, Germany has a special relationship to Russia, no question about that. There was a Second World War. But there was even more reunification. Mm -hmm. But I think the generation in German politics that, at the bottom of it, they felt grateful because they say Russia made it possible for our nation to be reun reunified. And there was 
an element of tolerance for Russia, mm -hmm. because of gratefulness for what Russia mm -hmm. did or made possible for Germany to do. And I can understand that. That generation is fading. And now you have a German generation of politicians that are living with Putin and what Putin has done. There was something fairly powerful in Germany the other day where Frank Walter Steinmeier, and I worked with him as foreign minister X numbers of years, uh, and he's now, of course, president. He came out and said, I was wrong. Yeah. And that's sort of slightly unusual for politicians to say, <laughs> and highly unusual for presidents to say and unheard of for a German president to say mm -hmm. on a subject that has been so strong for his country and for him personally. I, I think that was a profoundly important thing when he said that. Uh, and I think it shook, shocked a lot of people that he did. But I think it was courageous and should be applauded. And I think it's going to have a long-term effect. Mm -hmm. I was also impressed by the way with uh, Prime Minister Draghi, uh, because the Italian attitude to my wife is Italian. Um, uh, the Italian attitude to, to Russia has been one of complete ignorance of realities for a long time. But Draghi has come out very strongly uh, in this, to which extent it changes. Greece, of course, I, I remember eight years ago, I have vivid memories of when we had in the middle of that particular crisis a Gibnish meeting here to discuss what was happening in the east of... Uh, I will not go into the details. I'm a sort of... I have, some, the, the, the I have some, sli some yes. diplomatic sort of yeah. tendencies still. Um, mm. But anyhow, the change that has been to Greece is, when I see Greece's policy, is fairly fundamental as well. So Germany, yes, a change, but I mean, we see the change fairly fundamentally in other and, and I see my own country. I mean, NATO membership was unthinkable. The Social Democratic Party, they would, uh, it was sort of uh, off what was possible even to discuss, and I would expect them to, within weeks, take a decision to agree to Swedish membership. If I may add on Germany, I mean, it's going to take time for the reckoning to actually reach all the levels, because it is quite deep and long. I mean, it's you know, yep. 50, 50 years of Ostpolitik. Um, but there's one thing that I'd like to say. I mean, Germany is one of the wealthiest countries in the world, and all this is going to cost money. And I think already with COVID, we've sort of cross some thresholds in terms of you know, public debt, for instance. Uh, you know, and this is going to continue, because it's not just the war effort. It's not just reconstructing Ukraine. But it's also sticking to the goals that we set ourselves uh, with respect to uh, the digital and green transformation. And I'd like to emphasize the green transformation, because we must make sure that this war does not um, relegate uh, the climate goals um, to a second order tish, uh, issues, um, given that, um, you know, that, that, is for, that is for everyone. Um, that is about the future of the globe. So um, Germany, we need Germany because Germany is the, one of the largest economies and one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Um, and I think I'm not seeing the public discourse in Germany reflect this yet, but we need to get there. Um, there is a Green Party in government and they've made commitments. Um, so we can hope that they'll take some of those commitments seriously. Mm -hmm. um, how about the, the decision-making process in, in the EU? You, you know, this unanimity rule on these issues, um, foreign policy and defence. Um, do you think there is now a possibility to maybe you know, circumvent this, make some changes, decide faster? Me? Ladies first, yes. I have to say, I've never been one of those who <coughs> believes that QMV, the qualified majority, so using qualified majority voting in foreign policy would have been a game changer. I've always thought it really is about bringing together the strategic culture of European member states. Mm. Um, however, after Sunday, with the um, re-election of Viktor Orban in Hungary, um, I have to say that if some way of circumventing um, his opposition to um, common European decisions can be found, it will be, it will be necessary. Because um, it's not just that Hungary has been obstructing EU foreign policy um, for several years and has upped the game in that, in that sense. Um, and has so far, uh, the, the, you know, it's been, let's obstruct everything except for the really important things so that we can't get singled out too much. That has been the strategy so far, but I think with this re-election, He's emboldened uh, to go further. 
And Russia has, play, Russia has played a very critical role in this campaign. And he's been accusing Zelensky of interfering in the, in the Hungarian election process. Uh, and Putin, of course, rushed to congratulate um, Viktor Orban for his victory um, in elections that we widely know were not fair, even if the OSCE defined them free, but they weren't defined as fair. So I think on European foreign policy and, and the foreign policy making, this is going to be a real problem. We've seen all these strategic convergence, you know, uh, okay, there's still are, obviously there's still are differences of opinion, but they've managed to agree all sorts of things that until recently were quite unthinkable. Um, and this, with Hungary in the decision making, at the decision making table, it's going to be very difficult to pursue certain um, ideas. And I essentially agree agree again, uh, get somewhat boring up here. Um, in the sense, I don't think UMV would be the solution. I think it would create more problems than it would solve, uh, because it would create sort of a tendency, it, it would create a feeling among some of the smaller member states that they count for absolutely nothing. Yeah. And, and my experience is, tell you just, just one story to illustrate the, the nature of uh, foreign policy decision making. I, I was said I was there for I think 100 meetings or something like that of, 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 of the different councils. I can't remember any meetings where, well, I can remember one when one member state had a veto in foreign mm -hmm. affairs. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, we spent a lot of time agreeing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there was a member state who was slightly unhappy, but they didn't block because there was a constructive spirit. And sometimes it had to be said. The smaller ones were very instrumental. I remember in the beginning of the Libyan crisis, um, uh, I was listening to the Germans and the French and the Brits and the usual ones, and then I flew to Valletta and talked to the Maltese. And of course, the Maltese knew far more than everyone else taken together yeah. about what's happening. Or you can fly to Lithuania and learn about Russia. Or you can learn, fly to Athens and learn about other things. So the fact that we include everyone with their different perspectives is uh, somewhat tedious at times, but adds strength. But then I agree. We probably need to do something to have a decision-making mechanism where you, in certain areas, have sort of consensus minus one or constructive abstention and those sorts of things. Which has never been used, Which as have far never as I been. know. Well, I think there have been one case, but yeah. anyhow, essentially not be used. Um, in order to pre prevent one member state, mm. uh, be that Hungary or someone else, from blocking a statement or something like that. It's not only be the Russians, be the Chinese who have been experts, by the way, mm. in, uh, in using this. Perhaps two or something like that, mm. but uh, not more than that. Mm. At, yeah. at, at, at the end, the strength of the EU is when we can get everyone around the same opinion. And it is possible, even if it's time consuming. Um, do you think that in, in order to, uh, to, to enhance even more the, the panoply of the EU, it's now the time to, to close the gap we have in the Balkans, you know, push forward, uh, you know, the, 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 the countries which are actually not a member, North Macedonia. Uh, I know, Mr. Bill, that you know Bosnia better than probably anyone in this room and, and further than here. Uh, and how, we can, how can we do that? Let's start from Bosnia because I'm actually very interested and see how we can know Bosnia and then, you know, the others. I think we have a couple of fundamental problems. I mean, we now have, at the moment, we have a blockage, as we know. Uh, we had a blockage of North Macedonia for, for skip that particular yes. history. Yes. Um, now it's sort of Bulgarian or a Scorpio, Sofia issue. I'm fairly optimistic that can be sorted out. And then I hope that we can get that particular thing moving. Then we got, of course, a Kosovo problem. Uh, I will not go into the history of exactly what happened in 2008, but I don't think that was masterfully done. And we ended up with a fairly deep division, which is fairly difficult to overcome. And that blocks things. Uh, I think we'll have Miroslav Lajcak here tomorrow mm -hmm. to tell us about the Serbia. And we'll have the Kosovo prime minister. Um, how we unlock that, I don't know. But that requires some sort of novel approach. Uh, we've also got stuck in the enlargement process, and I think that we need to have some sort of new concept of an interim stage of some sort, uh, 
There are some ideas circulating around, but I don't think the Commission as of yet has been sufficiently innovative in having something that makes it possible to move forward absent a resolution of some of the issues that at the end of the day will be sorted out only at the end of those particular processes. Well, I think, and I've always thought that enlargement is a no-brainer. It has to be done, uh, but it has to be done well. And one of the reasons for which it has reached this stalemate, and it's been like this for, for quite some time, is, is that it hasn't been carried out properly. And I think you know, there, there are all sorts of reasons. There are all sorts of bilateral disputes in the Balkans. There are all sorts of um, issues, of, um, especially of governance issues and democracy issues. And, um, but I think the reason for which it stalled is actually a false perception of public opinion in Europe. Um, I don't think public opinion is necessarily against enlargement. I think it's a question of you know, providing the right arguments for doing that. Right now, the problem I see, I mean, number one, the process needs to be not just accelerated, it needs to be deepened, it needs to be strengthened. Um, and the big problem that we're seeing in the Balkans, aside from the, the um, various bilateral disputes, is that we have massive de democratic backsliding in some countries. And in fact, what we've had more so, we've had backsliding, democratic backsliding in some countries that have de facto been prized by the enlargement process, and then we've had massive breakthroughs on democracy in some countries that haven't been prized. And that is creating a terrible image problem, a reputational problem of the EU in the Balkans, because you, know, you have, you have um, um, uh, the Greek and North Macedonian leadership which reached an, a historic agreement, uh, the Prespa Agreement, and then North Macedonia is blocked from joining the European Union. I mean, what are the people in North Macedonia supposed to think? You know, that agreement was, was you know, it was very difficult uh, for the citizens there. But there, the additional problem is because there's democratic backsliding in the European Union as well. And the EU has let this happen. The EU is not just about the EU, it's about the member states, it's about political parties, political families in, in Europe. This has... Uh, the, um, the, this has, has happened. Um, political leadership has let this happen, and now it's damaging the prospects of enlargement of these countries. But from a geostrategic point of view, from an economic point of view, there's no doubt that enlargement is the way forward. And now we have three more countries that have just you know, submitted their application to join, Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova. Um, and um, we know that 2013, uh, Euromaidan, the second revolution that Ukrainians um, mm. uh, undertook in 10 years was because uh, their president decided to um, walk away from the deep and comprehensive uh, free trade agreements that had been negotiated between uh, Brussels and Kiev. And that you know, also triggered the um, Russian invasion of um, Donbass and the annexation of Crimea. So, um, so this is, is critical part. It's a critical part of whatever the EU wants to achieve in terms of label it strategic autonomy or Europe as a global actor. It doesn't matter what label we put to it. But enlargement is a strategic part of it and always has been um, since, since, in fact, since the beginning of the of the um, of the um, European Economic Community, with the first enlargement to um, to Britain. Um, and Ireland in 1973. So, so um, yeah, for me it's a no-brainer, but it has to be done better, um, which means uh, develop a new political process where the institu EU institutions have a bigger role to play. They have been, um, the Commission in particular has lost a lot of steering power um, to uh, the benefit of the member states, which haven't really done much with this power that they had. Um, you need to work a lot more with the citizens in, 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 um, in, in the Western Balkans. You need to work a lot more on strengthening the democratic institutions there. You need to work a lot more on fighting corruption in the Balkans and in, and in Europe. Um, and of course, that will be an issue for Ukraine as well. So there's a lot more that can be done. But otherwise, it's a no-brainer right? from, from the sort of... from the normative point of view and from the strategic realist point of view. Enlargement is the way forward. But, but how concerned are you that maybe Russia will try to uh, play ball in the Balkans to shift attention? Maybe through Serbia, which also has a elected leader. 
prior to February 24th, I was saying that I didn't see that as too large a risk. Mm. Uh, because Russia has other strategic priorities that are more important. They are distinctly against NATO enlargement in the Balkans as well. But I think NATO enlargement wasn't really happening anyhow. I mean, Serbia is not going to go into NATO. Mm -hmm. It's simply not going to happen. Uh, Kosovo is blocked by the issues that I mentioned. Bosnia will be blocked because of the nature of the thing. Um, so NATO enlargement wasn't really on the table. Then there were individuals and some of the very sort of evil characters in Russia that were playing around in, in the Balkans. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we had to deal with the fact, and history does produce things, that for the Serbs, Russia is 1914. Uh, it is the bombing of Belgrade by Germany in the Second World War. It is the bombing of Belgrade by NATO in 1999. Um, so the, it is the orthodox solidarity. Um, so it's not that the Serbs are going to join sort of the liberal Western anti-Russian consensus that easily. History does leave traces. But we need to convince the Serb leadership that their long-term interest, uh, and when you talk to them, they agree, is with the West, not with Russia, not with China. Uh, but now Mr. Vucic has had an election, so he's been sort of pandering to the obvious sentiment that is there with a significant section of the Serb uh, electorate. Um, and, and Russia has been playing a role, mm -hmm. playing with that as well. But um, if, if we are determined, uh, I don't think Russia is the main problem in the Balkans. The main problem in the Balkans is history. Mm -hmm. um, and all of the, the legacies of the past and the disputes that that has, uh, and the emotional blockages that that has created inside and within nations. I mean, you know that from the sort of Scorpio Athens issue, yeah. however you phrase that. Sure. You see it with even more incomprehensible, I would say, is the Scorpio Sophia. I mean, they, they, there we are back to what I mentioned in the beginning, the uh, sort of the theological debate in the early Christian churches. Yes. Uh, you, have, you have to be on that level of sophistication to understand what they are doing. And I, I could give you a list of X numbers of these issues that are still there. And only the European process that can, in my opinion, lift them out of these particular things. If, if we don't have a viable European process, the risk is the Balkans is they sink down in these particular contradictions again. Mm -hmm. um, my last question to both of you uh, uh, concerns China and how the European Union will have to approach China. I mean, we, have, we focus on Russia, but you know, China plays, I think, in everybody's chessboard, and uh, we have to deal with it. Uh, so, Ms. Powerful, I would like your, your view on this. I mean, is it, how should we approach it as a competitor, as a rival, as someone we have to work with? Well, I mean, the EU in 2019 published this document saying that we have to do all three things. And I, I don't, I think, so, well, the, the, I think the big question mark is where is China going to go in the current crisis? And I don't think we have an answer to that yet. Um, and then following that is how is the US going to deal with China um, um, as, as also as a consequence of how China is going to respond to the current crisis? Um, and I think then the third question is how is Europe going to deal with it? I think ideally Europe would prefer to have this sort of three-pronged approach uh, I think Europe will continue to want to talk with China about climate, um, and that, I think, is, is a very legitimate um, demand and, and expectation. Um, I also think through this economic statecraft, some of the tools that the EU is developing, for instance, investment screening, are also targeting China. The support, for instance, towards Lithuania, um, which is being embargoed by China because mm -hmm. of the Taipei-Taiwan Taiwan issue. Um, and also the way in which the EU is trying to invest on um, certain strategic sectors. Um, this is part of the sort of global impact of both COVID and now the war. Um, so the outcome might be a, more of an inclination towards, more of a tilt towards China as a systemic rival, but I don't think the EU, if, even if the US asked European states 
to adopt a position towards China which is you know, closer to the US's, I don't see that happening. I think there's too much diversity. Um, I mean, in the case of Russia, it never happened. You know, it had to invade a whole sovereign country unprovoked in order to create that shift, and we're not even sure it's going to last. So I think even the, in the case of, of China, these nuances will always be there. Um, and, and I think, to a large extent, it can be quite convenient. I mean, uh, a few days ago, there was the US, um, sorry, the EU-China summit, virtual summit, the first in a long time, and uh, nothing much came out of it, but it's, you know, it's important to talk. Um, and Europeans and uh, the US talked about it before the summit. Um, so it is possible, and it's, it can be quite convenient to have a channel of dialogue. So I, my feeling is that this sort of three-pronged approach will continue. Um, and um, I don't see the EU uh, really falling into a trap in which the world is painted in black and white terms. That's not really how Europe doesn't, it doesn't resonate with European history, um, and nor does it resonate with the way in which the EU has been set up. Um, so I think we'll see a bit more of a bit more ambivalence, um, you know, to the impatience of some of some partners. Uh, but at the same time, a greater awareness that um, you know, it's important to um, have greater distance on cer certain issues. Yeah. I suppose that also the way that China treats uh, Russia in the future will, be a, will play a critical role. Yeah. I understand. Uh, Mr. Bill, please. No, there is, of course, a fundamental differences that we must understand are there in our respective approaches. Um, <coughs> China has a political system that we profoundly dislike. No question about that. And uh, there are serious observations about the direction of domestic Chinese policies. But have, I have, as of yet, not seen them invading any other country recently, massively. Uh, and that does make a change in, I think, the attitude. It is conceivable to some extent to disconnect from Russia for Europe. I mean, there's the gas issue and there's some other issues. But essentially, we can disconnect from Russia. We can't disconnect from China. Uh, because China will remain uh, key when it comes to handling some of the global issues. I have one of my tasks at the moment is I have a special envoy of the World Health Organization trying to coordinate pandemic response. I have a conference call coming up in 30 minutes which has got to deal with the Chinese situation at the moment in Shanghai and what's going to be the, Im the impact of what we now see of the spread of the disease in China and the global impact of that and how we can help the Chinese. And uh, we can't close down those particular contacts. You mentioned climate, same thing. Um, so we will continue to engage with China, but it's going to be an, an increasingly critical engagement. And I think it's going to be affected, or the atmospherics of it will, of course, be affected, and also the substance to some extent, by how they handle the Russia relationship. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I would like to thank you both so much. Uh, I would like to save uh, one minute and 33 seconds for the, for the organizers, and I will also let you to go faster to your call, okay. because I know that it's important. Uh, thank you all so much for, for being with us. Stay tuned. Uh, more panels are coming on. Thank you so much.